The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. On the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark and saw that the stone was removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple went out and came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial cloths there, but did not go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there, and the cloth that had covered his head, not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. Then the other disciple also went in, the one who had arrived at the tomb first, and he saw and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Gloria that we just sang in Latin is 1,000 years old. And the sequence that was right before the, um, before the Alleluia is also 1,000 years old. It's in the program if you, you have it there. And so we are connecting with something that has moved people and souls and Christians and motivated them to make music and sing. Not just 1,000 years, but 2,000 years. As a, there's a, a song by um, uh, uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Martin, um, uh, Steve Martin, sorry. He, uh, C, Steve Martin has a, a song he plays on the banjo. It says, it says uh, atheists ain't got no songs. It's something like that. Look it up. Because <laughs> I got nothing to sing about. <laughs> that's brilliant, by the way. I thought that was just like, that's it. That's, he nailed it right there. But right here, when we have this gospel moment, we've got John, who is the author of this gospel, and he's also in this particular scene. And I don't know why he put in here that he ran faster than Peter. Maybe it's like a dig at him. Hey, I I can run fast. But he he goes to the, they go to the tomb, and, and this is what gives them this hope and this faith and this realization that this resurrection thing that they didn't understand that Jesus had been talking about all along was real and had just happened. Now, how do you get there from, we're with him, and then now the Lord is truly risen from the dead? People don't do that, by the way. They don't rise from the dead. That just doesn't happen. One of the theories as to why he, they, they had this moment of faith was that and it describes it, he puts it in here in the gospel, the way they saw the, the linens there, and then the, the, the sudarium, the, the head cloth that would have been wrapped around his head, it would have been covered in blood from this crucifixion, and uh, was rolled up and just neatly set there on the side. Thieves don't do that. Dead people don't do that. And if he had recovered from some massive... Um, I don't know, coma or something like that, you wouldn't think, oh, I should make my bed nice and neat before I, before I leave. The other thought is that, well, what was it about the way the claws were laid there that was so remarkable and so striking? And one of, one of the thoughts is that, um, is that the, the body would have been in there, in the cloth, lying flat out on the, on the, the tabla, the, um, the, the stone, and that, imagine this, let's, let's say the body was like a, a balloon or something made out of air, and you just in, uh, deflated it, and just the whole, and, or it just evaporated, it just ceased to be in there. The whole cloth laying flat would have just phew, rested right down flat, because he's not there. By the way, all the evidence on the Shroud of Turin points to something like that, because that's the cloth that was wrapped around. 
But, but even that, it's like, well, well, is that proof? What's well, information? Now, John had heard Jesus speaking and preaching, and he saw miracles, people being healed. They saw, John saw Jesus literally raise people from the dead, Lazarus uh, and, and others. He saw the miracle of loaves and fishes, but, but again, they still didn't put it all together. So he's getting this, right now, he's getting this massive information dump about this reality, this thing he's seeing. But, but even still, like for us today, it's like, let, let's, let's suppose it's exactly how he said, how he said it was. That doesn't necessarily make us all jump it up and say, oh yeah, okay, great, yeah, I believe. Because it. it's, inf- it's a data point, it's information. There's something more that was happening to John right in that moment. Something gripped his soul, his heart, that it all came together, all these data points, this information that he had, and it came down into his heart in an existential way, and he realized, it's true. The one who had done so much, who I'd seen transfigured, who I'd seen raise people, who I'd seen work these miracles, casting out demons, it's real. That's what he meant when he said he was going to raise from the dead. It wasn't a figure of speech. And so the data, the information, and the experience of his heart and his soul come together in this moment and is blessed by God with a grace that we call faith. It's existential. It's not just information that we say, okay, I guess I'm going to believe now. Okay, poof, now I believe. I'm a believer. No, it's, it's way deeper than that. It's like belief is something like, how can I deny the, the reality of what I just know in the depths of my being to be true? And, and he and John and all the apostles would go off and be martyrs for this data point. Because they knew this wasn't just some happening, or maybe it maybe arose some, I don't know. No, they were willing to lay down their lives and die. Well, John was spared he, uh, through a miracle from actual martyrdom, but they, they tried to. They tried to boil him in oil, but it didn't work. And not just them, but there was 500 other people that gave testimony having seen the risen Lord, because then the apostles, he also appeared to them, r- rose into heaven. And for 200 years, all the way up into the 300s, there was persecution after persecution, and they're saying, hey, take my life if you must, but I can't deny what I know to be true. Christ Jesus is risen from the dead, and he is alive. And his message is a message that saves it changes, and we've changed our lives, we've changed our religion, we've changed so much because of what we know to be true. Now, we're not all there all the time. It's not like we're all ready to just go out there and, and be martyrs, but, but I'm willing to bet that if you're standing here today, either someone drug you here, or you actually have some, at some level, of, so this kernel of faith. Or maybe it's more than a kernel. Maybe it's full-blown. And you're saying, yes, of course I believe. That's why I'm here. Last night, we had a beautiful vigil mass. And we had some, it was about 20, uh, 20 adults were baptized into the Catholic Church. Another 15 or so were uh, received confirmation, and all of them uh, re- received first communion for the, the for the first time. These are all all adults that could be, and I'm, I'm sure I know some of them are here today, uh, sitting out there, just people you'd walk by in the street. They're like quote like normal people. They're not religious fanatics or, or something like that, or weirdos who just got brainwashed and they say, okay, yeah, I'll do it. Is it no, no, no? These are people. Some of them came with great cost to become Catholic. And they were so joyful. There were beaming smiles and joy and happiness and peace that is not like normal happiness and peace and joy. It's deeper than that. 
Because the data points, it wasn't just the data points. It was the, not just the information, but this experience in this soul that I, how can I deny this? I, I, this is, it's, it's true. And I don't know it just in my head, but I know it in the depths of my being and my soul. I want to be a part of that. I'm going to share some, some stories of where they're coming from uh, anonymously so that you, um, to uh, protect the, the innocent here. But th- there's, there's one individual. I, I, don't, I don't even know if they're all here or not. So if you're here and if I get something on your story wrong, sorry, we'll fix it later. And, uh, but um, one individual moved here. This, this, I, this just blows my mind. Moved here uh, five or six years ago with the explicit plan to start churches, Protestant, uh, start churches so as to rescue Catholics from the Catholic faith, because in that Catholic church they're being damned for all that that that, that terrible theology that they have, and they're worshiping statues, and we got to save them. So he came here with that plan. And last night, in the middle of the night, he he was already baptized, but he received confirmation and he received Holy Communion, and he was smiling. And he was full of joy and happiness. He went to confession with a Catholic priest the day before on Saturday. There's another. Born atheist in an atheist family, and not just kind of like nominally an atheist, but like convinced atheist, and grew up atheist and just believing and knowing, had all this information of why God doesn't exist, and to be able to argue and explain that. And in her heart, something was just deeply yearning for a truth that gave meaning to life. And she tried in different, different ways, different avenues. It just wasn't working and it just wasn't fulfilling. And, and then, figuratively speaking, she, she meets this, this family and basically sort of like, almost like walking into the family, sees... The, it, what you have, that's what I'm looking for. You're, you're, you're happy and you're, you're and so, so, all of a, so now her heart's telling her one thing and she's able to then start deconstructing what was in her head. And she was baptized last night as a Catholic and received confirmation and Holy Communion and she was so happy and joyful and at peace, feeling more comfortable in her own skin than she has of her whole life. Another one was reading, uh, I don't know if you, you all know who Simone Weil is. It's a, a Jewish atheist philosopher, French, that was hanging out with the likes of like Trotsky and all that, and, but had this massive conversion, but never really became uh, fully Christian and all that. But, but just reading her story, it's like, I got to check out this Christianity thing. I got to check out this Catholicism thing. And she was baptized, confirmed, First Communion, and was smiling and beaming last night. Another one. I got a couple here. You want, should I keep going? I got more. I got more. Wait, there's more. There's another one. Uh, he was nominally, uh, nominally Protestant of some denomination or another, really not practicing, uh, hadn't been baptized, and maybe with his family gone uh, once or twice a year to to, to church, so it wasn't really that much of a part of his life. But, but he later, um, after college, got into um, some really dark stuff. I mean, he started hanging out with this lady who is um, a Wiccan, and and uh, and was was like some really like heavy, dark kind of kind of stuff. And so then all of a sudden, he's got demonic stuff going on in his life that he can't shake. He wasn't possessed, but he was like almost there. And so he goes to, to one of these a Protestant churches, and they're, and they're saying, like, hey, well, we, we really can't. I mean, we're not equipped for that, but you go to the Catholic church, they can help you. <laughs> and he's thinking, well, if, if they can't help me, but they can, I think I know which one I'm going to. And so uh, receive the help he needs, some deliverance prayers. And, and, now, and then last night he was baptized as a Catholic and came into the full into communion of the church and now is, and was smiling last night. Another one. Here we go. Uh, which one? one should I'm not going to do all of them because it would take too much time. And some of you have been standing already for a long time. Um, there's another one that uh, grew up uh, without, with really, without any kind of religion at all. And walks in, professional here, and works in Midtown, and walked into the cathedral. 
and just there was something just like felt like this is like home and it just and it would just made a habit of like on uh, on several days a week going in there and just sitting there and spending time in, in the cathedral. And then, and then at some point walking around the cathedral found that in the back of the cathedral, back behind the altar, where all the, you can, anyone can go back there, there's a, there's, a, there's a chapel in the back and there's this gold metal box that's back in there, a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And she really liked going in there because it was like that sense of being at, um, in God's presence was so much stronger there. And so a couple classes into the RCIA program, I, 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 uh, I, and she then related to me this story. And I said, hey, you remember how last week we had that class about what Jesus' real presence in the Eucharist is? Yeah, yeah. Well, when you go to that chapel, you know that metal box that's back in there? That, that gold, beautiful thing? That's where the Eucharist is. It's where it's kept there in the, in the cathedral. And she's like, oh, that's why I feel that way when I go in there. It just all came together. This existential experience, then coming together with the inference of the data points, so to speak, all coming together. Another one uh, uh, that uh, her, her comment as she's going through the whole process, she just said that, I just felt like this whole time God's kept me in this hug that just doesn't stop an ex existential experience that she can't deny the reality of it. Last one, last one, I promise. Uh, and I shared this at the 10th, this, this Mass a couple weeks ago, so those of you who heard this story, sorry, but there's a lot of visitors here, and this is an awesome story. This is it's, it's one of my favorite. This, this uh, young lady grows up in, um, in China, and she had met a Catholic once when she was a little girl. It was actually a, an aunt of hers who was a, a nun, and she, she just, like, something about, she didn't re have any faith whatsoever. Like, religion wasn't a thing in her family. But she, meeting this, this aunt that was a nun, she just really, I, I want to be that. Like, that, what, whatever she believes, I want that. It, it, so a small thing, a small moment. It wasn't like a, a long, extended. Fast forward, comes to New York, working, um, uh, work, works up in Midtown and, and finds a cathedral up there and walks in and, and she kind of puts two and two together like her whole life she had thought well yeah at some point I'll become Catholic not knowing anything about it and said oh this is a Catholic place I'll, I'll, I'll join this is all what I always wanted to do so I'm sitting down with, with her sometime later uh, throughout this, this past year and, and uh, so, uh, now there's a little bit of a language barrier and with work travel she wasn't able to, to attend all the classes so she missed a good bit and I said, so, well, well how's your Bible reading going? And, and she's, uh, she was like, uh, Bible? I said, oh, boy. <laughs> and so I get out a Bible, and we start showing, okay, this is the Old Testament, and this is the New Testament, and Jesus, uh, he's in this new part, and the first four books are about Jesus, his life. And, and then she says, and uh, who's Jesus? <laughs> I think, oh my, and, and she's already committed. She's already in. She wants to do this. She knows she would, there's something like a, like a magnet in her soul, like a tractor beam that's been drawing her to the Catholic faith. So I, I so okay, well, this is the first time I've ever done explaining Jesus from zero to a full-grown adult. And so we get to, we go through a little bit of prophecies, Old Testament, and so forth, and get to the, the crucifixion. And and, uh, and I'm, I'm explaining that there was a crucifix there, and it says, well, here you can see the nails and, and, and his feet and his sides. And, and, you could, and she was really struck by it, like saddened by what had happened to this one who was this, this such a key figure. And, and she said, well, that's, that's so terrible. Why would anybody do that? I mean, it, it kind of hit me, too. It's like, why would... So I, bring out the answers that, well, some were jealous, others thought they were doing a good thing. And, um, but, but anyways, that, but he died. And, and then she said the thing that I, I, I should have known was coming, but I, I didn't expect at all. She said, that's so sad, the story ends that way. That's so sad that that's how the story ends. And now I'm thinking, oh boy, is she going to be along for this ride? Because she's going to think I'm stupid for what I'm about ready to tell her. Because <laughs> people don't rise from the dead. Nobody does that. It's a ridiculous claim. 
And so I said, well, you know how we were talking about, you said about in reincarnation and, the soul, and how we said that, well, the soul, we don't reincarnate, or we don't believe in reincarnation, but the soul comes back to the body. It's, well, well, Jesus did that. He was the first one ever to do this body and his soul back together, but not to an ordinary life like us to die again, but to be eternally like that. And I'm saying, I, I hope she believes this because uh, this is kind of like early in the process to like say, and she just lit up and said, oh, Oh, that's so good. She was like relieved. And I was relieved that she believed it because I was afraid we might lose her right there because it's such a ridiculous claim that Jesus rose from the dead. And then things with the Eucharist, she did like all of it. It was just a grace that she had, this grace of faith, this ex to be able to receive faith, just have it come right in. The Eucharist, what, what is it? It's the body and blood. Okay, I got it. I'm there. All of you, uh, like I mentioned, I'm guessing have had some experience of not just information that somebody gave you, but some moment when God touched your life. He was present there and made himself real. And you knew that I can't explain this to anyone because it's just so much just for me. That, but I know it's true and I know that God did this. He did that. He was there in this moment. He was there with my loved one when they passed away. And I know they've, that my, my mother, my father is alive. Not here, but alive and risen. I can't tell you why. I just know. Think on those things. Let that, let that kernel, that seed of faith, feed it. Spend time with that. Thank our Lord for that. Our Lord has risen from the dead, as ridiculous as that is. In 2,000 years, we're still saying it. In 2,000 years, there's still souls who are saying, I, I want to be a part of this. Let me in. I want baptism. I want to change my life. I want to receive communion. And I'm willing to leave everything if I need to for this. Just thank our Lord for this gift we have all received.